Rotary clubs have a long tradition of having members take the podium to introduce themselves to their fellow members, and what my old club referred to as how I got to where I am. This is even more relevant to the E club, like ours, due to the fact that our membership is scattered across the globe, which makes it extremely difficult for each one of us to sit down at a table, share a meal, and share a meal with each other. So, to help us know, better know one another, of course, and of course, carry on the tradition, I would like to allow Neil, Dr. Neil Van Dyne the opportunity to talk a little bit about himself. What is he doing? How he got to this point? And why does it matter to him? So, without further ado, I yield the podium to Neil. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and greetings, everyone. Uh, as uh, you may or may not know, I currently live in Pion, Haiti, which is uh, almost right in the geographic center of the country. Uh, but I grew up in western New York State uh, on the Pennsylvania border south of Buffalo, New York. And uh, I had a fairly normal, if rural, childhood. Uh, my first encounter with Haiti was in 1985. Uh, when I was in college, and I came down with uh, what I would call a relief group, a, a church group, and uh, spent two weeks working at a seminary down in Port-au-Prince, and uh, in that two weeks just fell in love with the country. And uh, I came home, went back, and got involved in my college degree, and uh, about six months after that, my dad, who was an ophthalmologist, uh, came down to Pion to do volunteer eye surgery for people. And uh, right after he was here was when the Duvalier government was kicked out and the country was kind of, well, it was really in, in great upheaval. And the group that I had come down with never came back. And so, um, uh, but fortunately my dad was able to come back. I finished out my college years and in 1988, uh, my folks met a, a man from Arkansas, uh, name of Jay Lawhon, who invited me to come to Peon with him. So uh, two weeks after I graduated from college, I came down here to Peon and spent two weeks uh, working with their project. It was called the World Christian Relief Fund, and they had uh, a lot of agriculture work going on. They had some well drilling stuff going on and trees and some other, uh, many, many other small projects. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that time here. Uh, back and, uh, for an engineering firm for a couple months and then began teaching uh, high school. school, and high school now. And uh, in a couple of weeks, I with my parents, I had another short trip. And again, in the summer of 1989, I came down because I had the whole summer off as a school teacher. So I came down for the whole summer and uh, about halfway through the summer, I realized that uh, coming down, you know, uh, really experience that we had serious commitment to so and so. I'm gonna quit my job and Vocational technical here. Uh, here in October uh, on Halloween uh, 1989, so that was uh, 20 years ago uh, this past week. And I figured I would be here for a year and a half. <laughs> so a year and a half would be all it would take for me to straighten out this country and, and go back to my life in the States. Uh, but when I got down here, I got involved in uh, everything you've ever heard being done in a third world country. Uh, we started a primary school, we did sewing groups, we did goats and pigs and chickens and fish and rabbits and uh, grafted fruit trees and planted 250,000 trees a year and drilled wells. Uh, I built a factory to manufacture hand pumps, the Indian Mark II hand pumps here. And uh, I volunteered that way for five years and I worked crazy long hours. My dad, of course, thought that was the worst idea in the world because he uh, he was a doctor. He said, you don't have any money. You don't know anybody down there. You don't speak the language. What in the world do you think you're going to get done? And uh, 
since I was a obstinate college kid, I just said, yes, well, I'm going to go anyhow. That makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I did that. And five years later of volunteering, I was flat broke and married with two kids. And uh, I had to get a real job. So I, uh, I went to work for a USAID contractor here who uh, was doing a lot of community projects. I, uh, I spent, uh, oh, I basically spent about two years working for them and uh, doing all kinds of stuff. For me, it was like Christmas because now I'm getting paid a lot of money to do projects in, in Haiti. I was, uh, now uh, instead of doing trying to find twenty five dollars to build a solar oven or or this or a hundred dollars to buy some chickens, you know I'm building bridges and roads and schools and community centers and you know it was a blast for me. Uh, and I thought I could just do it for a while and then come back and do the work that I was doing up here before. And uh, it only took about three months for everything to grind to a halt after I left uh, uh, up here. Everything stopped. They stopped drilling wells. They stopped planting trees. They stopped building pumps. They stopped taking care of the animals. They did they, everything stopped. There was no ownership. And uh, it didn't take too much more thought to say, well, you know, these projects that I'm doing now, these bridges and roads and schools are, are the same way. The community doesn't really own them. There's no real ownership there. They just cost more money. Uh, so I had that in my brain and, and uh, uh, the group that I was with eventually set me up in the Turks and Caicos Islands. They had a beautiful condo and they paid me a pile of money uh, at a resort hotel. And, and uh, I did that for about five months and just realized I was miserable that I needed to come back to Haiti. Uh, so I quit. This was 1997. I quit that and uh, wrote a white paper about how we could create an NGO that was different, that was about the communities being engaged and the communities being responsible for these projects. And so I, uh, I uh, sent it out to a bunch of my friends that I'd met over the years. A, a group in Minnesota picked it up and thought it was a good idea. In 1989, uh, 1997, sorry, 1997, uh, we founded Haiti Outreach. That was 20 years ago this month. And uh, we did uh, uh, several projects. The very first one was a rather large scale water system, with 100 or 150,000 gallons a day of water a day, eight or nine, 10 miles of pipe. And uh, what we were going to do was we were going to provide the technical assistance for uh, this water system. So I did the engineering work and uh, Haiti Outreach would buy the pipe the concrete, the steel, anything that they didn't have locally, but the community had to provide anything that they did have locally, such as labor, gravel, rock, sand, so on and so forth, any of the local materials that they had. And uh, we had lots of meetings to organize the community and uh, get everyone aligned. And we started on January 17th, 1990, uh, 1998. And we had 200 people show up to volunteer and so that day we dug ditches and we uh, carried rocks and we carried sand and the next day we had 400 people and the day after that we had 500 people and the day after that we had 600 people and for the next four months we averaged around 600 people a day hauling rock carrying sand digging ditches we had masons volunteering their time to build the spring cap uh, putting pipe together uh, it was in really, really incredible. Uh, I, to date, I don't know of any other project that had that level of community participation. Uh, no money, no food, no, nobody was paid, nobody was given food for work, nobody was given any of that stuff. Uh, and uh, we worked on it for two years, uh, eventually, getting, eventually getting some food for work. But uh, two years later, we finally completed it and had a huge inauguration. Uh, USAID had given some funds and Japanese embassy had given some funds and uh, uh, World Food Program, uh, the Adventist Development Relief Agency. Uh, everybody came, it was a huge inauguration. TV crews, radio stations, director of USAID, uh, you know, they came, band was playing and TV rolling and they turned the faucet on and water came out and everybody was happy. 
And the very next day, they couldn't manage the water system. Not like a month later or six months later or anything like that. Very next day, they couldn't manage it. Uh, and it basically boiled down to this, because such a huge proportion of the community had worked on the water system, the ones that worked on it said, well, I, I worked on it. I should get my water for free. I should, you know. And uh, so the committee was very, very astute and generous, and they said, well, okay, that's great. You worked on it. So, you know, you should get some water for free, and people who didn't work should have to pay. So how much, how long should you have free water for? And they would say, well, forever. My, my grandkids should have water for free. <laughs> and, uh, and they just couldn't manage it. And uh, within two years, the whole thing collapsed, despite that high level of community participation. Uh, for a couple more years, we did that work. Uh, we we uh, did a couple more water systems that way. And um, we had also done wells uh, with hand pumps and uh, and pretty much implemented the best practices that people were using worldwide with the hand pumps. Uh, you know, they had to have a committee, they had to have a piece of property, they give a little bit of money, uh, sand, rock, gravel, anything, and then we would come and drill the well and they would help build the base. And, uh, and on top of that, we would train technicians. So in our area here, we had a technician we trained and he had a four wheeler and we had gave him parts and you know, we just said, here's a salary, go fix pumps. As we got farther and farther away, uh, you know, we did close to a thousand wells in those early years. And, and uh, as we got farther and farther away, uh, it was harder for him to do that. So we worked with the local mayors and got local guys trained and each one had 10 or 15 or 20 pumps that they could maintain and make a price with. And they bought the parts from us and they had a little toolkit. There was other areas where there was missionaries who said they were going to take care of it. There was areas where nobody wanted to be responsible for it. And, uh, and so, you know, it worked, but, you know, it seemed like a constant struggle to maintain the hand pumps. It just didn't work very well. Uh, you're always worried about this one's being broken and so on and so forth. In any case, we kept doing the wells, kept doing the water systems, and... Uh, Eventually, we were doing a system down in Bukankare, very close to uh, the Partners in Health Hospital there near Mirbele. And that was the same deal. We bought the pipe, did the engineering, and they were supplying the labor and local materials. And near the end of the project, uh, one of my guys came in and uh, sat down in my office, and he said, uh, we need to build an extra water fountain in Bukankare. And I went, well, we only we designed it to have this many two or however many it was uh he said yeah but we sat down and we met and we agreed we all agreed that they need a third one uh and i said well we're over budget we don't have the money we can't do it we can't just can't do it well he was defending his people and his community so he started arguing with me and said well we have to do it we have to do it we have to do it so i looked around and i said well we have money in a budget for this next project, for this other project. But if we take money from that one, we're gonna to have to put it back. So if they're willing to reimburse the money for that fountain, then, uh, then I'll take it from this project, but they're gonna to have to reimburse those funds. And uh, my guy got furious with me. He said, we're an NGO, we're here to give people stuff. We're not here to ask people for money. People aren't here to pay us, no, 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 no. Since we didn't have any other way to do it, he reluctantly agreed that that was the only way we could do it and went down to talk to him. He came back into my office three days later and said, uh, we got to do this everywhere. He said, as soon as they realized that they had to pay money back for that fountain, it was a light bulb moment for them. They were like, whoa, of course. And what about these other fountains and this valve and the pipe and the spring and the tank? We are have to have money to replace those too. Just like that, they owned that whole system, despite a year and a half of them working with us. It was only in that moment that they actually got responsible for it. And, and they did. They paid back the money for the fountain, and they now have a fund, and they are able to maintain the water system. Uh, that was in 2004. So that pushed us to look at, at things a little bit differently for the wells, too, because uh, those clearly weren't working. It was, it was all about giving people water. 
And so I sent a guy out on a motorcycle with a GPS unit to survey all these wells. And he went out to five, six, eight hundred of them. I don't remember how many. And I came back and put them into a, a GPS, a simple, very simple GPS called Keyhole. But now it was a thing. So I could overlay all the and basically, I found that half of the wells were broken. All those wells I had done over the years were broken. And I was really discouraged. Basically, half of all this work that I had done over the years being lost. So we started thinking about how we could do that. And, and uh, it hit me that that was a management problem, not really a technical problem. Because the, the reason it hit me is because in this area around here where we were paying somebody to maintain all the pumps, half of the wells were broken. And in these areas farther out where people had their own little businesses and were maintaining pumps, half of those wells were broken. In the area where we didn't even train a technician, half of the wells were broken. In the area where the missionaries were gonna maintain it, half of the wells were broken. And it varied by a couple percentage points, but nothing really statistically significant. And uh, so we said, wow, this is really a management problem. And we changed our game. We started treating it as a management training uh, rather than a technical training on how to repair the pump. And uh, essentially overnight, we went from half of the wells working to 90% of the wells working. I mean, overnight. The very first well we did that way worked. Uh, but we still had our brain that we had to train technicians. So we bought all these pumps and we bought a uh, I have a whole room full of uh, toolboxes, the toolbox that they use to fix the Indian Mark II pumps. So we said, we're going to train three people in every community, so there's lots of people that know how to fix the pumps. And we did the first well, and the second well, and the third well. And we said, okay, well, let's wait until we got like 10 wells. We'll do a training for 30 people, and we'll go from there. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 wells done. So then we said, well, let's just wait until one of the pumps breaks because then you know when it breaks we'll do the training and then they can go out together and fix this pump and they'll have practical experience so we waited one year two years three years five years and uh, for more than five years not one of those pumps broke down for even a single day so uh, I, then we had to of course ask ourselves well you know we can't train a technician now to remember how to fix a pump in five years it's got to be something they do regularly so i still have a whole room full of these toolboxes uh the india mark ii repair toolboxes right now we have one guy on our team uh who's responsible for 400 pumps or so if he fixes if he fixes more than two pumps a month i would be surprised uh, so uh, that, that really is the nexus of what we've gotten into. And, and from 2005 to today, to 2017, 12 years, uh, we still have 90, 93% of our pumps are operating. Uh, those 400 some communities have more than 50, almost 55,000 US dollars in savings combined. Uh, um, then we, uh, in 2011, we started looking at the sanitation piece of that because it's not just water. It's not just water, it's sanitation. And what we discovered was that uh, when we inaugurated a well, about 75 or 80% of the houses had latrines. No matter how many had it when we began, about 75 or 80% uh, had them when we were done. We thought, wow, that's interesting. And uh, basically what was happening is that people were getting responsible, uh, not only just getting responsible for their water point, but actually getting responsible for being healthy and having clean water. Uh, and uh, the way that happened was uh, that we now have the community write us a letter, and I can go into a lot of detail about this, but when the community makes a request of us uh, to do a well in their community, they're just trying to get a well. Uh, how we want we want a well how do we get a well we need a well and uh, we field that letter and go back to them and say this is great you know you want a well we do wells that's really good so 
how long do you want to have that well for? And they say, no, we never really thought about that. And they have a conversation as a group, six months, eight months, a year, two years. And as a group, they come to a consensus that they want to have it all the time. And we say, well, that's nice to have it all the time. That's really a good idea. And then we ask them what kind of water they want. And they hadn't really thought about that either, but they have another conversation. River water, rain water, muddy water, salty water, no, 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 no. And they come to the conclusion that they want good, clean water that's not going to make them sick. So just in that one conversation, they start to move from a community trying to get a well to a community that has clean water. And uh, to have clean water, now they become critical thinkers about this. And so to have clean water, they have to keep the well clean and they need to wash their hands and their buckets need to be clean and the buckets need to have lids on them and everyone needs to have a latrine and people need to uh, keep their animals away from the well and so on and so forth. So now it becomes them driving this conversation about how do they stay clean and keep their water clean. And out of that 75 or 80% of the houses uh, we found were building latrines uh, before the well was inaugurated. Now, over time, we've increased that and engaged uh, the National Water Service and the mayors and elected officials. And uh, I think for the last year and a half, that number has been 95% of the houses building latrines. Uh, with 40% 40, 40 of the communities where everyone has a latrine. So there have been some really, really incredible resi results. And, uh, and uh, and we've been so highly successful. In 2013, we started asking ourselves, how would we know if we won the game? How would we know if we won the game where everyone in the world had access to clean water? And we said that, well, we'd need to know where the houses are and we need to know where the water is. And so out of that, we created the mapping that you guys, uh, that we explained in the other video. That was in 2013. Uh, and that's now how we move that forward through an action plan, engaging the communities, aligning local officials, and national water officials. So it's become a very powerful national program. Uh, the Haitian government has modeled the sanitation component, their national sanitation strategy on our, on our model. And, uh, you know, now we're trying to figure out how we put enough of the pieces in place to actually, uh, take this toolkit to a international scale. How can we actually take these pieces and this mindset with this level of intention and actually drive a conversation where uh, it's much more than Haiti, but everyone in the world. So uh, as part of that, in, in June, uh, I, uh, I met with the Rotarians in Atlanta and uh, we began having a conversation. That's been going on for quite some time, obviously, but. Uh, in June, we started having a conversation about what that would look like. And uh, we're now working with the Rotary uh, Foundation and Ron Denham of uh, Washrag. And, uh, and now you guys. Oh, this is, has been the impetus for me to join the eWash Club, is to uh, work with a, an amazing group of wash experts from around the world to see what we can do about playing the game where everyone in the world has access to clean water and sanitation. So that's what I'm up to. And thank you. So, you know, it's really interesting because you guys have touched on three issues that are near and dear to my heart. I think the first one is actually that it is a management issue as much as if not more than a technical issue. A lot of people get so wrapped up in the technology, they they forget the soft elements, and uh, yeah. for me, in order for a product to uh, be sustainable, you've got to recognize those elements, as well as cultural yeah. logistics and all that, all that stuff. The other right. thing that was really interesting for me was that the need for a sense of ownership. You, know, you can't be everywhere you know, all the time, and if the communities are not having a sense of ownership, again, things break down. I mean, and those are things we have really talked about. And, and the third one for me was that. You talked about, you, you alluded to, actually, you alluded to partners. I mean, you can't be a lone wolf. you got to begin to look out and find out who your partners are, whether they're NGOs, mayors, uh, religious organizations, in the country, pieces like that, and, and, and grab those partners to be your eyes and ears or help you with logistics or help you 
you know, in a number of different directions. And, and sometimes it's very hard for a lot of people that initially get involved in building wash projects to fully realize that. They think, well, I'm just going, I'm going to go to a house of friendship. I'm going to see this great technology. I'm just going to put it in that country and be done. You know, people yeah. put it well in. They, they get their snapshots or little photo ops or delays. And everybody's saying, hello, how are you doing? And then, as you mentioned, two years later, it's broken. Yeah. Yeah, I found that actually. It doesn't take very much searching on Google to find that pretty much that 50% rule holds worldwide uh, in almost every third world country. Yeah. 50% of the wash infrastructure broken. Oddly enough, I was asked to help out another Rotarian that was involved with Mercy Ships uh, develop a matching ring. And basically, that was what it was. Is they, they had discovered that about 14,000 wells in Africa had been broken. And they wanted to make it their mission, if you will, to go back into Africa and fix those wells. Yeah. Well, that, that's great. <laughs> <Not> that <word>. <laughs> but <laughs> who's to say they're not going to get broken again? Well, of course they're going to get broken again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have groups too that uh that come to us with better pumps, you know. They we have a pump, you know, and really the problem with the pump is that the bearings are too close together. So they move the bearings farther apart and there's less leverage on it. And there is a bigger meteor pump, you know. So, you know, now it now it, it requires only half the maintenance. You know, <laughs> you know, but it's still going to break down. Anything that's mechanical, anything that you build has a design lifetime. So, you know, at the at the extent of things, even if you design it so it's going to last a hundred years, what is how what do you what is that community putting in place so that after a hundred years they can replace it without having to come ask you, yeah. right? No matter how well you design it, it's going to have a lifetime, right? The moment you put it in, it's going to start getting old. So, and that's a great point too because you know I've been to plenty of forums where you know you get a uh, representative about some new technology, whether it's a pump or a filtration system or whatever, they all seem to think they've got the magic bullet. Now, it's going to be a yeah. magic bullet. Technology is the magic bullet. But in reality, it's really the, the, the management of a technology, or at least understanding how to place a technology based off needs or reality for that situation. That's right. how you, it's really more how, how you begin to look at it. Yeah. And it really becomes more of a, a process-driven program than a product driven program. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, and, and you know, we, we don't pretend to know everything. We just pretend to be more obstinate than most and refusing to give up. <laughs> but, you know, many years ago, the, uh, the whole issue of women in water and, and women being responsible and powerful players and actors in that, you know, even back in 2004, 2005, we made that part of our conversation. And, you know, we were going to train two women and one man in every community because they're much more stable and they're the water bearers and so on and so forth. And, and we've maintained that as part of our program. We actually track how many women are on the committees. Uh, and, you know, it shows up as a red flag if less than half of the committee members are women for us. So, you know, that, that's something that we came up with ourselves. It's, you know, people talking about that and participating in it. So, you know, we have a lot more to learn and do to really make a, a really, really good program. Well, we have a good program now, but we can make it much better through the input of other wash experts from around the world. And so that's what I'm uh, excited about, participating in the wash club. Yeah, and that's why I'm so excited about Justin Morris and her group uh, talking about gender issues, because as you know, even Fonkers A, you know, they, they realize that as we all should, that women are really the stakeholders for the houses. And if you can't get it to women involved, you're after the center. Yep. Well, well yep. thanks again. Uh, you know, this has been really good. I think it's a great way of kicking off this presentation. And uh, I hope that everybody has a chance to uh, basically uh, to listen to you and also hopefully uh, connect and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, and if they wake up after the end of the video, you know, they'll, they can turn it off after, after they wake up. <laughs> I hope it wasn't too boring. <laughs> it, it, it was great. It was great. Oh, thank you very much, Rob, for the opportunity to do this. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Neil. Bye.